Hi there, my name is Ryan Dickerson and I'm a Brody student in the class of 2025 and this is our video on embryonic development of the body cavities. As always, here's our mission statement for Scrubs. Scrubs is a student-driven initiative that aims to develop supplemental resources for current and future cohorts that will pass through Brody with the idea that we have gone through the courses and we want to help develop resources that we wish we had been exposed to during our time in the course. As always, quick disclaimer that these resources are made as supplemental resources to help aid in your learning, but they are in no way a replacement to the instruction by your Brody faculty. So we hope that you utilize these resources for their intended purpose and they can aid you in your journey. With that, let's go ahead and dive into the material. Starting off, we need to think about uh, the overall goal of this process. So we're trying to go from a trilaminar disc where we have our different cell layers, our endoderm, our mesoderm, and our ectoderm. And here we can see that we actually have the neural tube starting to form along with the notochord uh, and kind of inducing that process to start to resemble something that looks a little bit more um, human-like in the embryo. So we start to have different cavities forming. We start to see that we have a head fold, a tail fold, and then eventually we're going to get into the adult structures. So what I want to start with is what is the end result? Because we know it's a lot easier to think about adult structures and working our way there because that's a definitive known that we've learned about previously in anatomy. So the cavities in the adult um, human is we're going to have a thoracic cavity that's superior. Uh, the thoracic cavity is going to be broken up into a couple different components. We're going to have the pleural cavities which hold the lungs. Those are going to be on the lateral walls. And then in the middle we're going to have the pericardium um, and the pericardial cavity which is going to hold the heart. And so that's in the anterior inferior region of that uh, thoracic cavity. Now the thoracic cavity is separated from the abdominal cavity by the diaphragm. You might also see the abdominal cavity referred to as the peritoneal cavity, which is how I'll refer to it throughout most of uh, this video. Um, but that again, separated by the diaphragm. And then underneath the abdominal cavity, we're gonna have the pelvic cavity. So the big thing for this video is that we're starting with the trilaminar disc. And somehow we need to form these separate cavities. Primarily we're gonna be thinking about the compartments of the thoracic cavity, so the pleural cavities as well as the pericardial cavity, and then the peritoneal cavity or the abdominal cavity here. That's the big goal. So let's go ahead and dive into how this process is going to occur. So again, recall that we have the trilaminar disc formation, and the big thing that I want to remind you of is that we have endoderm that's coming down forming this inferior layer, and blue here, this is representing the mesoderm. This mesoderm is going to differentiate into different regions, and then we have the ectoderm that's overlying it. So those are all of our germ cell layers that we're going to need to keep track of throughout this entire process. So as the notochord is forming, again the notochord is mesodermal tissue uh, that is condensing along the midline, it is going to help differentiate the different surrounding mesoderm into regions. So the region directly adjacent is going to be our paraxial mesoderm, then we have our intermediate mesoderm, and most laterally we have our lateral plate mesoderm. Remember that our ectoderm, superiorly, has the amniotic cavity uh, in this space, and then our yolk sac is inferiorly and is surrounded by our endoderm. So that hypoblast layer from development is now completely replaced by endodermal cells. Right. What you're going to notice, and this is going to be really the highlight of this video, is that this lateral plate mesoderm is going to start to separate into a layer that's associated with the ectoderm and a layer that's associated with the endoderm. And that space that forms in between is going to be known as the coelom, okay, specifically the intraembryonic coelom. So let's go ahead and dive into how this is all occurring. Okay, so the first step in body cavity formation is really be the beginning of formation of the intraembryonic coelom. And this is happening because that lateral plate mesoderm, which we talked about, is going to be separating into two components. The component that is associated with the ectoderm superiorly is going to be the somatopleur. So somatopleur have forming the overlying ectoderm and somatic mesoderm. And then the splanchnopore inferiorly is going to have the underlying endoderm and the splank mesoderm. Okay. The space that is forming in between is going to be referred to as the intraembryonic coelom. So the, initially the coelom starts as a little indentation. It starts to grow. We can see that there's greater separation between the somatopleur and the splanchnopore. And then eventually as the body continues to grow, the lateral walls start to come in, and we're going to call these the lateral folds, are going to start to collide, and eventually they're going to fuse at the midline. During the same process, the splanchnopore is growing anteriorly, and it's starting to surround the yolk sac. And eventually what will happen 
except for in the region of our umbilicus, we're going to have the uh, splint of fluid is going to come around and it's going to surround the gut tube and completely section this off from the rest of the yolk sac. Okay, so you can imagine these walls fusing as well. All right, so the big process here, we have the lateral plate mesoderm separating into the somatophore, which is superior, again, somatophore having ectoderm and somatic mesoderm layers, and then the splanchnophore, which has the endoderm and the splanchnic mesoderm. The lateral folds start to come around, and eventually they're going to fuse at the midline, and that's going to form the intraembryonic coelom on either side of our gut tube. Okay, so we have these two columns that are kind of running through the developing embryo, and this is a space. Okay, so again, the entering embryonic coelom. On the last slide, we saw that the entering embryonic coelom was, we viewed it in a transverse view, so coming across. Here we're looking at it in a coronal view, and what you can actually see is that the entering embryonic coelom is forming this uh, horseshoe-shaped structure that goes up over top of the future uh, oral cavity of the developing embryo. And so um, what I want to point out here is, again, because we looked in transverse, that's why we saw two columns previously. Now, what's important here is when we look at this image, the intramuronic coelom is actually located a little bit further distally than the oropharyngeal membrane, which is going to be the future development of the mouth and oral cavity. So this is going to help separate some structures for us. Just uh, underneath the intramuronic coelom, so the intramuronic coelom is this region in white here, we see that we, there's this a uh, red pink looking structure and that's actually going to be the primordial heart. So it's going to be the region of mesoderm that's going to derive the um, the heart tissue. And then if we go even further distally, we're going to see a structure that we're going to call the septum transversum. And the septum transversum is uh, mesoderm and it's going to be one of the main components that's going to contribute to your diaphragm. So you think, well Ryan, my heart and my diaphragm are definitely not above my head. In the, in the adult, and you're entirely correct. So what has to happen is we somehow have to force this region down inferiorly into a more anatomically correct position. So this happens due to growth of the developing brain. So as the brain starts to grow, it starts to move superior and actually is gonna push these structures down anteriorly and inferiorly. Okay, so what's gonna happen is that we're gonna have the intramuronic coelom, which is in the region of this developing heart, and so because it's in the region of the developing heart, we're going to call this specifically the pericardial coelom. It's going to be forced inferiorly. We can see this process happening. So the forebrain continues to grow. It gets forced inferiorly. And then we're going to see that we have the heart located here, or the developing heart. We have the pericardial coelom, which is just anterior to the heart in the developing um, adult. And then inferiorly, we're going to have the septum transversum. And again, I mentioned that septum transversum is going to develop components of your diaphragm. In the adult anatomy, our diaphragm is located just inferior to our heart. Okay, so this starts to make a little bit more sense. So we went from this linear structure, and now we're starting to rotate down. And this is due to the head fold. Okay, I also want to point out that the endoderm here, this region of the gut tube that's captured in this head fold, is going to be referred to as the foregut. So that's all of this uh, gut tube that's captured due to the head fold occurring. So this image gives us a little bit more information about what happens when we finally have the result of the head fold. So again, the uh, intraembryonic coelom is going to be a structure in pink here. And the intraembryonic coelom, again, we said initially is going to form as a horseshoe, and then it's going to start to be pushed down by the head fold here. So as it's getting pushed down, now we see that the coelom is located as pretty continuous cavities all the way from the rear, around the heart, and then back around. Okay, so eventually what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to separate this coelom into three different regions. We're going to need to separate it into the pericardial cavity. We're going to need to separate it into the pleural cavity, which is where our lungs are going to grow. And then we're going to need to separate it from the peritoneal cavity more inferiorly. So at this point, when everything is connected here, we're going to call this the pericardio-peritoneal canal. So the pericardio-peritoneal canal, because this is a connection between the peritoneal cavity and the pericardial cavity. So this structure here is going to be called the pericardio-peritoneal canal. Okay, so currently we have this pericardio-peritoneal canal that is kind of connecting all of these structures, and now we need to separate this or separate our cavities into the cavities that we're going to have in the adult. 
So the first cavity that we're going to talk about being separated is going to be separating the pericardial cavity from the pleuro-pericardial canal. So how does this occur? Well, up here you can kind of see this is the region we're looking at. We're looking at a cross-section through the developing embryo. So this is a transverse view. We mentioned that the intraembryonic sebum is located anteriorly to the heart, which we see here, and then the communication is going to run down the body as the pericardio-peritoneal canals. So, directly beside the developing gut tube, we're going to have the lung buds start to form. And these lung buds are going to start to push out into the lateral wall. And again, remember the lateral wall is made of somatopleur. And this is going to cause an invagination of tissue known as the pleuro-pericardial folds. Okay, so remember specifically pleuro-pericardial folds are forming first. And they're being forced into this orientation due to the developing lung buds, which we can see in yellow here. So these folds are going to, as the lung develops, they're going to continually be forced to the midline. And eventually they're going to fuse. Okay, they're going to fuse right here with the component of the mesenchyme, which is just another component of the mesoderm, that's anterior to the future esophagus. And so the esophagus will be developing here. All right. So what I want to point out is there's also a nerve that's incorporated into this structure, and this is going to be your phrenic nerve. Okay, so your phrenic nerve is arising from the lateral wall, and then it's getting pushed over. Okay. Now, what's interesting about this is as these pleuropericardial folds start to fuse, they're going to get thinner and thinner until they're referred to as pleuropericardial membranes. Okay, they're going to continue to thin out, and eventually these pleuropericardial membranes are going to form the fibrous pericardium, which is the adult derivative of the heart. Okay, so forming the fibrous pericardium. So this is now completely separated the heart from the uh, pleuroperitoneal canal. So we went from pericardioperitoneal canal, take out the pericardium because that's now separated, and now we're left with the pleuroperitoneal canal. Okay, so our end result is forming the pericardial cavity and then the associated pleuroperitoneal canals. All right, so and then the pleuroperitoneal canals at this point are surrounding the lungs, and then um, they're still connected with the peritoneum inferiorly because we don't have the development of the diaphragm yet. Okay, so this is going to be our fibrous pericardium surrounding the heart. And again, because this fibrous pericardium, big point I want to make out here, is because it was derived from these pleuropericardial folds, that means it is composed of the somatophor. Because again, this is a lateral wall mesoderm that's being forced anterior or forced midline uh, to eventually fuse to form the fibrous pericardium, which we see surrounding the heart. Okay, so now at this point, we've separated our pericardial cavity from our pleural cavity and our peritoneal cavity. So we're now left with the pleuroperitoneal canal. So the pleural cavities and peritoneum are still connected. We know under the adult this isn't the case, they're separated by the diaphragm. So now we're going to have to do one more separation. So how do we separate the pleuroperitoneal canal is really this, this next step. So what's initially going to happen is we're going to have growth of the lungs to form the pleuroperitoneal folds. Remember for the pericardium, we had the pleuropericardial uh, folds. Now we're having the pleuroperitoneal folds. And these are going to be located posteriorly, kind of right underneath the developing lungs. So here is where you would have the pleuroperitoneal folds. Right. Anteriorly, you have the mesenchymal structure that we call the septum transversum. So again, the septum transversum sits anteriorly in this region. So as the lungs continue to grow, we're going to have the pleuroperitoneal folds are going to start to collapse anteriorly towards the septum transversum. So they're growing anteriorly. Okay. Eventually, they're going to fuse at the midline, and this is going to make up the different components of the diaphragm. What I want to point out is you're also having fusion at the midline with regions of the dorsal mesentery of the esophagus. Okay. And just like in the uh, pericardial cavity, the uh, fusion here is going to occur first on the right side, and then it will later occur on the left. So the right side fuses before the left, and we'll see why this is important in uh, the clinical correlations at the end of this video. All right. Now, once this occurs, you still have a little bit of space around the lateral wall, so you're going to have lateral wall mesoderm that's going to invade, and it's going to form the peripheries of your diaphragm. So in total, you're going to have four different components of the diaphragm, which we'll dive into in the next slide, but you're going to have the dorsal mesentery of the esophagus, you're going to have the pleuroperitoneal 
folds, which will eventually flatten out and form the pluriperitoneal membranes uh, before eventually contributing to the diaphragm. You have the septum transversum anteriorly, forming a lot of the muscular components, and then you're going to have the lateral wall mesoderm that's forming the periphery. Okay, so the end result here is that now we've formed the pericardial or pluripericardial folds and membranes separating the pericardium from the pluroperitoneal canal. And then we have the pluroperitoneal folds uh, forming the pluroperitoneal membranes, which eventually will separate the pleural cavities from the peritoneal cavities. So now we have our big cavities that we see in the adult. Okay, so as we mentioned, we're continuing to develop. We've now separated our uh, body cavities, and we've got these contributions that are leading to the development of the diaphragm in order to do so. So again, we mentioned the septum transversum, which is located uh, anteriorly. The septum transversum, again, is made up of mesoderm, um, and this is going to develop into the central tendon of the diaphragm or this central region of the diaphragm that you can see here in the adult structures. Those pluriperitoneal membranes, which again were located posteriorly and they grow, grew anteriorly to fuse with the septum transversum and mesentery uh, distal to the esophagus, this is going to lead to a uh, small intermediate part of the diaphragm that is mostly muscular. Okay. Um, and then we have the dorsal esophageal mesentery. So again, this is mesentery that's just posterior, or sorry, just, um, yeah, just posterior to the esophagus. And this is going to eventually lead to the crur of the diaphragm, which are these two structures here. So you have a crur on the right and you have a crur on the left. Okay, and those are derived from that dorsal mesentery of the esophagus. Lastly, this peripheral margin of muscle is going to be derived from the lateral walls. Okay, so this is lateral wall mesoderm. Okay, coming from that somatoplur. Okay, and this is going to form the peripheral margin. Now, why is it important that we understand the different contributions to the diaphragm? It's going to be because there's going to be different innervations for the muscular and sensory components. So the phrenic nerve is actually traveling within the septum transversum during development. So it's embedded within the septum transversum. Remember that initially the septum transversum started superiorly and the head fold brought it down. So initially it's in the region of spinal segment C3 through C5 but then it's going to move inferiorly, okay? And then the phrenic nerve will innervate all of the muscular components of the diaphragm. So the reason that we have the phrenic nerve, which is found in C3 and C5, innervating a muscle that is uh, kind of in the region of T12 to L1 when we think about vertebral le levels is because the septum transversum is giving rise to a large majority of the diaphragm. And this was initially in development starting in the regions of C3 through C5. So that's why we had the front nerve C3 through C3, C3, C5 inter, uh, innervating the motor components of the diaphragm. Now, the phrenic nerve also does some sensory innervation, but it's only going to innervate sensation to the median or medial parts of the diaphragm, whereas the intercostal nerves are going to innervate the lateral aspects of the diaphragm when it comes to sensory innervation. You might ask, why is this? Why is it all split innervation? And again, this is because the lateral musculature is derived from the lateral wall. Okay, so this peripheral margin here. And so this means that the sensory information from this region is going to be coming from intercostal nerves. Okay, so when we think about the diaphragm, split components, all of the motor components are being innervated by the phrenic nerve, spinal segment C3 through C5, whereas the sensory components to the median or the medial region of the diaphragm are going to be also contained with the phrenic nerve, and the lateral margins are going to be receiving innervation uh, for sensory innervation via the intercostal nerves. So here's an overview of kind of all the steps that we went through. We're just going to knock this out real quick. Um, as a summary slide, so you had development of the lateral plate mesoderm. That lateral plate mesoderm is going to separate into two layers. You have the somatic layer and splanchnic layer um, of mesoderm, and that's going to form your somatoplure and your splanchnoplure. During this process, you're going to have formation of the intraembryonic coelom. This is formed between those two layers of mesoderm of the lateral plate, um, and eventually this limic space is going to surround the embryo and in this horseshoe-shaped cavity that we're eventually going to separate into the adult body cavities. So that means we have to partition the coelom and form the different body cavities. The big body cavities that we're thinking about forming are the pericardial cavity, the pleural cavity, and the peritoneal cavities. And we talked about how these are going to separate in development. One of those forms, uh, one of those processes is the development of the septum transversum, which is going to be just inferior to the developing pericardial cavity after the head fold comes down, and it's eventually going to lead to a contribution to the diaphragm. Okay, so we talked about the 
folding of the embryo, incorporating all these layers. Eventually, the uh, silicic spaces are going to um, change names because we're going to have the pleuropericardial folds, which are going to form to separate the pericardium from the pleuroperitoneal canal. And then we're going to have the pleuroperitoneal folds, which is going to finally separate the pleural cavities from the peritoneal cavities. Okay, and lastly, we have continued development of the diaphragm to the adult structures. Uh, and this is formed by four embryonic components. We have the pleuroperitoneal fold, the septum transversum, the dorsal esophageal mesentery, and the lateral wall mesoderm, all contributing to adult derivatives in, uh, in de development. So now let's knock out some very quick clinical enemy. Two uh, processes that both occur due to failure of the lateral folds to fuse in midline are going to be ectopia cordis and gastroschisis. So again, these are both due to failure of the lateral folds um, to fuse. So one of these is going to happen in the region of the thoracic cavity. And because our heart sits in the anterior aspect of the thoracic cavity, you can have protrusion of the heart through the thoracic wall. And this is known as ectopia cordis. Similar to this, but happening in the abdominal cavity, is what we're going to refer to as gastroschisis. So gastroschisis is going to be protrusion of bowel throughout through the abdominal wall. And this, does, importantly, does not happen through the umbilicus. It's happening through the actual abdominal wall. And it does not have a covering membrane. This is going to be important because it contrasts with omphalocele. Omphalocele is a similar protrusion of bowel um, in the, in the uh, embryo or in the fetus. Um, but this protrusion from phallocele is going to happen through the umbilicus and it's going to have overlying membrane. And we'll talk about this later in another video. But the big thing here is gastroschis gastroschisis is due to failed lateral fold fusion at midline, more often on the right than the left. Um, and this is not going to have a membrane that's covering it. So there's a big uh, thing to know differentiating gastroschisis from a phallocele. Lastly, um, development of a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So a hernia is basically just saying that there's a space in one of the abdominal wall compartments uh, allowing for bowel to pass through. So in this case, we're thinking of a, a hole in the diaphragm allowing for the stomach and intestinal contents into the pleural cavity. So as you can see in the x-ray, this can be pretty significant. Um, if you have a large hole in the diaphragm, that allows bowel contents up. And this is actually going to keep the lungs on this side from developing. Okay, so we're going to call this lung hypoplasia, which can be pretty severe in uh, neonates. So the way that this, or the reason that this occurs, is because you have failure of that pleuroperitoneal membrane diffuse on the left side. Okay, so this is primarily going to be happening on the left. Very rarely will happen on the right. One of the other thoughts behind that is because you have the liver developing over here on the right side, so it helps to support the developing diaphragm. Okay, so when you think about congenital diaphragmatic hernia, think more often on the left, it can cause protrusion of the bowel into the pleural cavity because now you have this connection between the pericardial cavity and the pleural cavity because the pleuroperitoneal membranes did not fuse um, at midline. And so this is going to lead to lung underdevelopment, also known as lung hypoplasia. And with that, that will bring us to an end of this.